Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. Looks like the sun has come back out. We've had some rain and some dreariness. Uh, there's a lot of people we need to be praying for that have been impacted greatly uh, by this weather, by these hurricanes. Uh, hope that you will keep them in the forefront of your mind. Uh, so I, I said good morning. Have you, have you ever heard the phrase, that's not a hill worth dying on? You ever heard that phrase? Or maybe you heard it like this, that's not a hill worth dying for. Well, um, either way, it, it means basically the same thing, whether it's a hill worth dying on or a hill worth dying for. The phrase refers to the idea that some things, and, and let's be honest, some things just aren't worth fighting over, are they? You ever gotten into an argument over something and then realized after the fact that it just was not worth it? All the fussing and the fighting and the frustration and the ugliness and the bitterness and the damage that it does to relationships just didn't measure up. The outcome was not as wonderful as you had anticipated it. The concepts of winning and or losing, they truly didn't seem as glorious as you had expected them to be. Have you been there? Now, unfortunately, most of us probably have been to that place. Most of us have camped out or, or fought battles right there on that hill or on one just like it. Now, the original phrase or, or question, is this a hill worth dying on it's actually a variation of, of a military expression strategically speaking whenever a battle takes place on an elevated terrain it's always always in the defender's favor now what i mean by that is that whoever already owns the hill whoever possesses the hill or has the high ground they have a tactical advantage it's much more difficult uh, to overcome an enemy's defenses when you're being forced to do so at a height disadvantage, when you're looking up at the enemy. It's also where the phrase, you're fighting an uphill battle, comes from. Maybe you've said that one. In fact, history records numerous military battles just like this, battles that quickly turned into bloodbaths. Whenever commanders have forced their soldiers to fight in order to take control of a a hilltop, the attacking forces generally get slaughtered. There are typically huge, huge losses, and any form of victory that they might get comes at a very, very high price. And as a result, conventional military wisdom says that hill battles like that should be avoided if at all possible. The cost in men, the, the loss of life, not to mention the depletion of other of other resources or equipment or time the overall cost generally is not worth the fight that uphill battle so they'll often con often consider the rationale they will ask that mo utmost important question is this really a hill worth dying on and that's a valid question to consider especially when you're thinking about the lives of many many soldiers and it could I could even apply this question or consider it as we examine our scriptural text for this morning. So please turn with me, if you will, to the opening of Romans chapter 14. If you've been around for a while, I think you will know that in the life of the church, just like everywhere else, there are times when conflicts arise. This is true. It always has been true, and it will remain true, at least until the Lord Himself returns. Now, why is that? The reason there are conflicts within the church is because the church is made up of people. And whether we want to admit it or not, people are flawed. And some of us really, really, really like to argue. Now, Every last one of us is flawed. Every one of us in here and every one of us out there, we're all imperfect. Now the difference is, most of us in here, most of us in here know and accept that we have been forgiven. And hopefully we understand that our forgiveness also came at a very, very high price. Now we celebrated communion together just last week. 
And we did so in remembrance of that high price that was paid to secure you and, and I and the forgiveness that we often take for granted. All right, as I said, this morning we're in Romans chapter 14. We're going to begin our reading with verse 1. So please follow along if you would. The Apostle Paul is giving instructions here to believers concerning others within the church, other believers within the church. Beginning with verse 1. Welcome those who are weak in convictions or in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord God is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day honor it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and, and lived again, so that He might be the Lord of both the living and the dead, or the dead and the living. May God bless the reading of His Word for us this morning. There was a man who, he just wasn't feeling right. So he consulted his family physician, like many of us would do. He went to see his, his primary care physician, his family doctor. When he got there, he said, hey, doc, I, I really need your help. I've been misbehaving an awful lot here lately. I've been doing things I know that I shouldn't be doing. And I got to tell you, my conscience is really, really bothering me. And the doctor replied, he said, let me guess, sir. You, you want me to prescribe something that will increase your willpower. Well, no, said the man. I, actually, I was hoping you could give me something to weaken my conscience. Here in Romans chapter 14, uh, the Apostle Paul, he's dealing with matters of Christian conscience and, and matters of personal convictions, especially as they relate, as they relate to the relationships of the strong and the weak among believers. The prescription here in chapter 14, it's far from what the man in my illustration was seeking from his doctor. Paul doesn't praise, nor does he condemn the oversensitive conscience of those who are what he calls weak. In fact, he's encouraging us as followers of Jesus to accept our fellow believers to accept them wherever they might be on their current walk with the Lord, on their personal pilgrimage of faith or their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Whatever you want to call it or however you want to put it, we're talking about the fact that each one of us, if you really think about it, we are each on a faith journey. This is a journey that began the very moment we first chose to believe. Wherever you were, whenever that was, whether it was last week or whether it was 35, 50, 60 years ago, we've been on a journey chasing after Jesus Christ. Some of us may be just a little bit farther along on that journey than others. Maybe we've been at it just a little bit longer than some people. Maybe we've traveled on down the road a little bit farther than some. Maybe we've gone a little bit deeper. Maybe we've grown a little bit stronger in our personal faith than others. But hopefully, every last one of us is attempting to become a little bit more like Jesus. And a lot less like who we were when we first started this journey. Am I right? Is that the plan? I heard a pastor once say that 
the favorite indoor sport. The favorite indoor sport of most Christians was this. Trying to change one another. No, it's not that we're trying to love one another or pray for one another or even support one another or meet one another's needs. Instead, it appears that too many Christians are egotistically striving to conform fellow believers into their own image. When it's Jesus Christ we're supposed to be pointing at. When it's Jesus Christ we're supposed to be leading others toward. He alone is the standard. Troy Pearson's not the standard. You're not the standard. It's the one we're chasing after. He's the standard. In our text for today, the Apostle Paul, he's telling us that that we shouldn't be trying to change other believers to suit our own personal preferences or to satisfy our own individual convictions. And we all have those. And they're not necessarily bad things because we're all in a different place in our journey, right? Instead, when we're dealing with fellow believers who may be weaker, and let me to identify that, who may be less mature in their faith, we should consider changing our own conduct instead of looking at them and pointing out all the things we see that are wrong with them and all the things that they're not doing correctly. But we need to do this without compromising the Word of God. And there's the trick. There are hills that just aren't worth dying on, people. Now look at our text. The the Apostle Paul, he seems concerned that believers in Rome, they needed to accept one another. you got to remember, Rome was a a veritable melting pot. There were people from all different cultures and walks of lives and backgrounds, and, and they had been exposed to all kinds of things, not unlike this city we live in. Think about the melting pot that Harrisonburg has become. We have tremendous opportunity here. Tremendous opportunity because none of us knows the encounters that you have with an individual maybe from outside this country. You have no idea what that encounter might do and how God might use that. You take them and you introduce them to Jesus and they take Jesus back to the Middle East. They take Jesus back to China, to Syria, wherever. God... God kicks doors off hinges. That's what God does. In our text, Paul first talks about the issue of eating or not eating meat. Then he shifts to discuss the observance of certain days as being holy days. Now, both of these were issues in Rome um, by which the, the believers there were strongly judging one another. You don't worship the same days. You don't hold the same days holy that I hold holy. I know I saw you chewing on those ribs. You weren't supposed to be eating that. I know it sounds silly, but we do something very similar all the time. We look at each other and we make judgment calls just like that. Paul's basically deeming these matters that he's talking about here that he brings up as non-essential matters. He wants his readers to understand that all believers are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Every last one of us is under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We're not under each other's lordship. There's one Lord for all of us. As the Lord of all, He will also be the judge of all. Jesus is the one to whom we will all give an account for our actions. All of us. Jesus is the only righteous judge. So you and I need to ease up a little bit sometimes on the judgment of our brothers and sisters in the faith. Sometimes we just need to back off on that a little bit. Now, let me clarify something, because I know some of you are probably squirming a little bit. The Apostle Paul is not condemning all forms of judgment here. That's not what he's doing. He's focusing on, like I said, like he said, non-essential matters. I'm talking about these issues where the Bible really isn't giving us definite commands. In in another writing, Paul, he corrects believers over in the church in Corinth, and he corrects them for not judging a man who was sinning within the church there. That man was blatantly committing acts of immorality, and he told them, you must deal with him. 
Because he is affecting the body. He is affecting those that don't know right from wrong. You must deal with him. And we know that Paul, if we look at his writings, we look at the, if we look holistically at the Word of God, this guy, Paul, he wasn't tolerant of anyone who dared to alter the message of the gospel for their own purposes. He wasn't tolerant of that, and we shouldn't be either. The difference is this, on issues of morality, the Bible gives us some pretty clear and specific commands. Thou shalt not do these things. Most of us know those. Most of us are aware of some of those issues, some of those commandments that we have within God's Word. How about matters of essential doctrinal truth? I'm talking about things that may or may not keep someone from entering into the gates of heaven. I'm talking about if we start to muddy up who Jesus is, if we start to muddy up how do I get to heaven, how do I be forgiven for the sins that I've committed against God, how do I get right with God? If we start messing with those things, I'm going to fight. And you should too. If it's something that's going to confuse someone and take them away from coming to Jesus Christ, we need to stand up. On these things, we don't need to budge at all. We we cannot compromise. We, as followers of Jesus, would be wrong not to judge others who claim to be believers when God's Word calls for us to hold one another accountable on these types of issues. Morality issues. doctrinal, Doctrinal truth issues. But it doesn't allow for us to nitpick one another on every little thing that we might disagree over. There's a difference. I hope you're seeing what I'm saying. There's a difference here. As with most things, when it comes to our personal relationships, both with the Lord and with others, there are hills that just aren't worth dying on. There are many other secondary areas where you and I need to be a little more gracious maybe even a little more tolerant with those who might differ in opinion from us. On these non-essential matters, we're not to judge them or to treat them with contempt because acting like that does not exemplify the love of Christ. Jesus didn't treat people like that. Nor does it reflect His nature. What did Jesus do? If we go and read about him, he would meet people and he would accept them wherever they were in life. You're a prostitute? Let me me love you. Let me show you what love looks like. You're a tax collector? You're a sinner? Jesus Jesus got criticized because he ate with sinners. What? He hung out with sinners? If you hang out with sinners, you're going to get judged too. That's where you should be. Because if you're not hanging out and telling them about Jesus Christ, who's going to tell them? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have fellowship. We do, and we need it because it strengthens up. As, as, as iron sharpens iron, we need to rub up against one another. But we can't keep it to ourselves. We can't stay in our bomb shelters, hiding in our backyards. We've got to get out, and we've got to meet people, and we've got to share the love of Christ. Christ! Not the watered-down version that I often sometimes offer. The love of Christ that accepts people and realizes they may not know Him yet. And just because I might be a little bit farther down the road on my journey doesn't mean I get to look at them with contempt and judgment. You want to turn somebody off towards the church? Go ahead and view them through judgmental eyes. Go ahead and insist that you are the one that's right and they are the one that's wrong on all kinds of non-essential issues. That's when people start calling us hypocrites and they start running away from the church. That's when I start to hear people say, I don't want anything to do with organized religion. Have you heard that one? I bet a lot of you are shaking your head going, yeah, I've, ha- I've got friends that say that. I don't want anything to do with organized religion. What they're really saying is they don't want anything to do with people who are not showing them Jesus Christ. It's not that they don't like Jesus. It's because they aren't seeing him. They aren't experiencing Christ when they do come to church. 
Sometimes it's okay to agree to disagree. And sometimes you have to fight. But you don't have to battle over every single disagreement. In Paraguay, I had a friend. He was a fellow teacher at the Christian school where my family lived and served. He was a believer, but he was also pretty heavy into the theory of evolution. Many of the other Christian teachers that we worked with, they had kind of shunned this guy. They didn't want much to do with him, and they, they didn't hang out with him. They didn't talk to him a whole lot because he thought differently than they did on a few matters. But he and I became pretty good friends. We had these great intellectual discussions. I know you might chuckle, as intellectual as I can get. But we had these great intellectual discussions on the difference in, differences in some of our beliefs. On some things, he and I would have to look at each other and just agree to disagree. And you know what? We remain friends. Can you imagine that? To agree to disagree, but still be friends. What? He didn't conform to the likeness of Troy Pearson. What? You know how I was able to do that? Not that I'm some great person. I'm not. The reason we were able to do that is because I knew where my friend stood on his beliefs concerning Jesus Christ. I knew where he stood when it came to God's plan for the restoration and the forgiveness of mankind. And the fact that Jesus is the only way to heaven. He and I were on the same page. I knew that my friend had been saved by his personal faith in Christ. And that his place in the kingdom of God had been secured. He wasn't being immoral. He wasn't blatantly breaking commandments or teaching all kinds of false doctrines that led people away from Jesus. Knowing that the Lord Jesus is ultimately His judge and not me, and accepting the fact that God is my judge, I try to be careful to consider which hills are worth dying on. And which ones are not. So today I say to you, pick your battles. Some hills just aren't worth dying over or dying on. And we need to remember that every one of us serve as representatives of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And our goal is to lead people to Him. Not to chase them away from Him. We have to stand on this. We have to stand upon the Word of God. And we also need to, need to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God to guide us and direct us all. And to bring conviction and discernment into our individual lives as individual people chasing after Jesus Christ. But we also need to pray that God will bring conviction and discernment into the lives of fellow believers those who are walking with us on this journey. Those that may be, as Paul said, weaker in the faith. And there are those that are stronger than you and I in the faith. And we do well to remember that. Let me close our time together with what's written at the end of Colossians chapter 3. It says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. People, we don't need to fight over things like music. The worship wars have already been fought. And there were a lot of lives lost. There were a lot of people who wandered away. We don't need to judge people by the way they dress when they come here to church. Especially if they're coming here to seek out the face of God. The Lord Jesus just wants us to be here. He wants us to be present and accounted for. 
Does it really matter if you have a tie on? Does it really matter if the person sitting next to you has got on a pair of jeans? Or a sports coat? Or whether they're wearing a polo versus a button-up shirt? There was a kid up here singing in jeans and red tennis shoes today. What in the world? These things don't really matter. God's looking past all that. This little girl who was sitting up here today, it's her first time visiting Westside. She knew. She knew that you, don't, you treat people the way you want to be treated. God's looking past all those things that we get hung up on sometimes. He's examining what's really going on in here and in here. And you're not fooling him and neither am I. None of us is fooling him. I don't care how you get here. I don't care what you wear or what type of music you listen to on your way in or how you part your hair or if you have any hair. I'm just praying that every last one of us can be impacted by being here. And that when we leave here, maybe we leave here just a little bit closer to Jesus Christ on our journey chasing after Him. Some hills aren't worth dying on. The last thing we need to do is chase people away from Christ. There's enough of that going on. You're flawed. I'm flawed. We're not going to get everything right. But we've got to try. And we've got to trust that the Holy Spirit's going to guide us. And we need to be careful with those judgmental eyes. People need to know that God loves them where they are. And if we can't love them where they are, how are they going to see that? Right? We want to help people farther along on the journey. Sometimes we've got to hold their hand and limp along with them. I'm guessing somebody probably did that for you at some point on your journey. I know they've done it for me. If my wife, she's not here so I can talk about her. If my wife hadn't come into my life, I wouldn't be here. God used her to reel me back in and to take me by the hand and lead me back into His presence. And I'm so thankful that He did. You can be that for somebody else. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we love You. Thank You for loving us despite our flaws. Thank You for loving us despite the fact that sometimes we're disheveled and we're not clean shaven and sometimes we're a little bit dirty around the edges of our heart sometimes our minds aren't as clean as they should be sometimes we look through the goggles of judgmental eyes and sometimes we're not as loving and as forgiving as we need to be father god help us to discern which hills are not worth dying on and which ones we need to make a stand at until we breathe our last and dying breath and may the last words be out of our mouth expressing the love of Jesus Christ. Help us, Father. Help us to, to see people a little bit more like you see us. Help us to invest the time. Lord, we learned Ilsa invested 10 years in the life of this lady, this Mama Fatima. Ten years seems like a long time, but it's worth every second if she entered through the gates of heaven upon her breath, her last breath. Worth every bit of it. Every ounce of frustration and wonder and tears. It's worth every bit of it. Father God, help us be inspired. Help us to, to realize that that we are supposed to be tools in your hand. Loving tools in your hand, not judgmental tools. You're the only one that gets to sit on that judgment seat, not us. Lord, I, I know, help us to discern. I know there are things we should not overlook. There are things that we should never condone, allow, stand by and watch happen. I get that, Lord. Teach us. Help us to see and, and be sure when we should make a stand. 
but also to be sure when we need to just say, it's not worth it. And let you lead them gently. Let us love like you love. And remember that you forgive us all the time and you look past our shortcomings all the time because you love us and you see what we can become, not what we are right now. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for the depth of your love that not one of us deserves. Help us. Help us to be more like you and less like who we used to be. In Jesus' name, amen. We're getting ready to sing one last song together and then we will part ways. How will you respond to what God's telling you today? If you're here today and you don't know Him and you've never given your life to Him, this is an opportunity. Don't let it pass you by. If you feel a tugging in your heart and you know you need to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, any, there's an, any number of us who would love to talk to you about it. I would consider it an honor. If you're here and you're struggling and you just want somebody to pray with you, turn to the person next to you. You'll be prayed over. If you want to come to the front and just kneel here, we'll all pray over you. If, you want, if, I'm, if I'm free, I'd be honored to pray with you. If you're looking for a church home, everybody needs a church home. If it's not here, then I, I, I'll do my best to try to help you find a place. But find a place that you can call home, that you can plug in and invest and roll up your sleeves and maybe run a little bit farther down the path chasing after Christ together. That's what we're supposed to be doing with one another, for one another. We're supposed to be encouraging one another, lifting one another up. Yes, we hold one another accountable, but we're not nitpickers and tattletales. We're warriors for Christ. If you're here today and, and you need any of these things, um, I, I'm not special, but I'm standing up here. If you need somebody to talk to, Please come down the aisle. It's not that scary. It's pretty wide. It's not that scary. When we sing this last song, if you want to be prayed over, you don't have to tell anybody what's going on, we'll just pray over you. If you want to talk, I'll be glad to talk to you and pray with you, as would anybody you're sitting next to. The single most important decision you will ever, ever make in your life, the only decision that's going to follow you beyond the, the grave, beyond your last breath, is whether or not you've chosen to live for Jesus. And that's the one thing that if you feel that tugging, don't leave here today. Let's talk about it. Let's stand. We're going to sing one last song together.